Hello everyone, welcome to Modernize Your Applications During Fedora Upgrades. Um, my name is Vincent Svinstra. Uh, my uh, Fedora account system name is uh, Evilissimo and I'm a community member since 2012. I'm working for Red Hat as a senior software developer. So what are we going to talk about? What is Leap? How can it help Fedora? An overview over Leap and I um, would like to do some live coding of actors to show you um, how that works. So what is Leap? Leap is a framework for application and OS modernization. What does that mean? means updating, upgrading the system. In that matter, also upgrading your applications, updating configurations, uh, migrating them to new styles of migra uh, up, um, configurations or transforming your data. Isn't that what DNF or RPM is doing? Yes, but also no because there are a lot of things you can't do. For example, as I said, like transforming data is very, very, very um, dangerous to do in a RPM transaction, and we shouldn't do that. And there are a lot of things you can't do uh, in RPM transactions. They're for for mainly forbidden by the RPM uh, packaging guidelines. So what Leap can do is it allows customization and extension of the upgrade process. It utilizes the NF's uh, RPM capabilities and allows additional modifications around, around it to be packaged. So what does it mean, like, uh, modifications? Well, you can modify the transactions. You can add packages to the transaction. You can remove packages from the transaction. You can replace a package with another one and things like that. So how can that help Fedora? Well. You can make optional things uh, available to users during the upgrade. Allows you to add the ability to ask the users questions during the upgrade process. It allows you things to do during the upgrade which are, which you should not or must not be doing uh, during RPM transactions. It allows the DNF upgrade transaction. And now I will give some examples of what I had ideas for what we could have done or could do um, with Fedora uh, and uh, this kind of upgrade process. Now, that said, these are hypothetical and all the examples are not implemented. So, idea number one. Ask the user to switch to the new bootlo bootloader specification automatically during the upgrade. Um, as maybe some of you know that uh, we we introduced the bootloader specification, which gives a unified way of def describing bootloader entries uh, for the kernel and with all the configuration options, uh, which is um, basically the same across uh, different types of bootloaders, in including GRUB2, and uh, I think it's called Zippo or something like this. <coughs> this is how this could look like. During the upgrade, the user could be asked, like, do you want to migrate to this new, or do you want to convert your uh, bootloader entries to, to the new um, configuration format? Another thing what we can do is detect, for example, Python 2 application in Scrim and sub subscribe to Python 2 channels. And with channels, I mean modules, like to a module stream. It's like, it's like an example how this could look like. Python 2 module stream is like the title. And then it's like, we detected Python 2 scripts on your system. The new version of Fedora gives you the opportunity. Python 2.7 module stream, how would you like to continue? And then you can switch to it, do nothing. That means like default behavior would, would, would be, and abort the upgrade. Another idea would be detecting Python 2 application scripts and warn the user about this discontinued support. Very similar message, and then it's like uh, ab ability, for example, to show what scripts are affected, and it would pa uh, print the list of scripts it was fi uh, it found. Um, this 
In this example, this has been actually implemented in a, in a way that it tries to compile the Python 2 um, or <coughs> the, the Python modules with Python 3. Just compile them and try to see if, if it fails. If it fails, it would give you this message and give you all the scripts that failed. Well, it's just, there's a, a PyCompile module from, um, the question was like what I mean with compile. And um, Python has a PyCompile module which I can run uh, from the command line and just uh, pass it a script. And it basically, it will do the syntax check. So if, if something would not parse, it would like immediately fail. Of course, this is not like 100%, uh, but this was just as an example for the first, um, for, for demo purposes. <coughs> Another idea is like, for example, to de detect that there's a Postgres 9 installation, like it was on Fedora 27. There is like, I think, 9.6, if I'm right. And uh, we would ask the user if they would like to describe, uh, subscribe to the 9.86 module stream or if they want to upgrade to the latest and greatest version instead. This might actually be something that is very useful for people who have a, are a bit scared about transforming already during the upgrade their database, especially if it is big, um, to a new version. Uh, it might actually break their application if suddenly they, they, they come up with a newer version or things like that. Um, th and that's like where modularity can actually be great. And we would be able to transform the, my, uh, the tra upgrade transaction not to upgrade it to version 10, but instead would use the, in the modularity version uh, 9.6. So another example of the output thing. It's like the options are like, hey, switch to 9.x stream, upgrade to latest, upboard the upgrade, and so on. Another idea, ask the user if they would like to apply new, newly implemented service defaults or stay with old ones. If you want to change service defaults in Fedora and someone has like changed them, there might be a reason like for that. And um, I'm not sure what the RPM transaction does, but we can give them the ability when we detect that someone modified them, that that they can uh, keep their old settings in some way, and instead of getting some RPM new or RPM old uh, files in the end. And well, there's like just some ideas what we can do. Another idea, and that's like also a little bit in conjunction with the title of the talk. Um, we can allow third-party applications, uh, creators, to easily hook into the upgrade process. Right now, this is very, very difficult because um, they might want to do something like uh, enable repositories before, uh, and and uh, or change some or, or need to do some steps before they can do the upgrade. So we will give them the ability to upgrade their applications during the upgrade, add, remove, update, uh, add, remove, or update the repositories for the new major version, and things like that. And they have the ability to do this after the download. They can they can add maybe packages somewhere, uh, do their own download in the in in the phase. They can do a lot of changes to the to to the or influence the up RPM upgrade in in a way that does not. Um, it's not possible, basically, right now. <coughs> um, well, and I've prepared a demo for this. Um, What we do here is like we start the leap upgrade. It's like it shows first of all that it's a Fedora 28 machine, and uh, I recorded it today. <laughs> and uh, I will run. I will show you that it's up to date with the latest packages and everything. And then I will execute the leap upgrade, which should be happening any second. So and there you can see the questions which I was showing you in the as the ideas, how this would look like in the process. Um, please beware the log messages you see are currently during the development uh, uh, present, 
but they will be uh, removed and there will be uh, more sensible messages should be printed during the, um, during the upgrade. Um, but it helps a lot during the development to see if actually your, your stuff get executed or not. Basically, this is what, will, what you would see in a verbose mode. Um, we would enable the logs that you can see them. And if you need even debug logs, you would have additionally to specify the minus minus debug uh, option. So right now it would like uh, it edits uh, to the DNF call. It added actually an additional repository with my with my um, repository for the for the uh, leap um, um, RPMs, so they can actually get upgraded because like if they wouldn't be there, they would break also the transaction. So it's actually sped up. I hope. No, it's the right one. Come on. It, it, it feels like stuck. <laughs> no, it is not the right one. Sorry. Started the, the, the long version. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so let's. Okay. Okay. Now. Okay. So we're back where we were. So now I can see the cursor blinking really fast if you sit close enough. So now you see uh, I sped this up like I think 60 times or something so because it's basically what it does it just like downloads the packages and reboots then it starts uh, running in a um, init RAM disk and will resume the upgrade and this now you can see that here and then DNF will start running again but this time uh, in the offline mode with using the cache packages only and he's going it's going to apply the transaction which also of course it's never that s that fast. <laughs> Wishful thinking. <laughs> <coughs> well, and after that, um, again, and uh, basically you will end up in the Fedora 29 system. And um, unlike with the DNF system upgrade, you um, don't have to run like two commands. Uh, I think it is a bit more convenient. I, I, I don't really understand why vision like this made. But, uh, well, so here's the reboot into the new system, and we will end up in a raw height, basically. It's like you can already see 29 raw height. And basically, this I will do the same thing I did before with the um, OS release. So I think. That's it. Um, so back to this. So um, a proposal for this, uh, I will try to publish after flock. Um, not immediately, but like sometime after flock. Um, it's not available yet. And an expected time frame when we could do something like this, make it uh, available for um, for Fedora, is like probably around version 31 or 32. I don't know. This is really hard to say because it will also need a lot of work from uh, our <laughs> contributions from a lot of uh, community members because um, we can't know all the things that can be done. And it would be really great to get also some feedback on that. What community members have ideas about like what could we do on top of it. So an overview over Leap itself. So Leap has um, the notion of workflows 
which means describes the whole upgrade process. What we have seen here, that's called in-place upgrade, and that's one of these workflows. And each of these workflows have phases. And you, I will visualize this uh, a moment later. And each of these phases has three stages. Um, phases basically give you the ability to order your um, your execution of your modules or actors, how we call them, um, at a specific time during the workflow. So if you say like, ah, oh, I need to run before the download, and um, I, you can do that. If you want to uh, run in the init run disk at some point, uh, for example, after the application, um, the upgrade transaction has been executed, uh, you can do that. And you can even do on the first run, and a lot of other things. So it's too much to display. We have like a lot of phases, and um, if this is necessary, we can even add more. Um, actors are basically the individual modules that can actually do some action. That means they're the scripts that you can write to extend uh, the capability of the upgrade. Messages are um, sent between uh, actors. That is a way of providing data from one actor to another. That means like if you, in the beginning of the, um, of the workflow, you start scanning for something, you have one actor, and later in the init, init run disk, you want to apply the data or will use the data to transform it, you would write a second actor that consumes that message. And these messages um, contain a definable model, which is basically the, you can define that way the pay payload of the message. Um, models uh, are assigned to topics, uh, which is at the moment purely um, it's it's not really used at the moment, but the idea is that you can start searching for data when you're debugging stuff based on this, and you can subscribe uh, can uh, review logs or anything easier like this because you can search for a specific topic what is in there. Um, it could be like something like networking, uh, system information, like storage information. That these were, would be topics we would put there, and they could be also like for third parties. They could put their own topic there to find their own messages easier. Um, tags are used to um, designate actors for a certain phase. And um, because we have a notion of also repositories, uh, where all of this data, which you've seen here, all of these items are in, in simply in there and uh, can have multiple purposes. So to define where an actor belongs to and, and to which phase and to which workflow and even to which stage um, that is defined by uh, the tags and yeah. Additionally we have uh, libraries. Um, they are private and shared libraries. Um, libraries are Python modules that can be used uh, by the actors and can be shared across them. That is when they are defined on the repository level or can be used like to uh, make the, the code of the actor better testable. Um, because like actors have um, tests um, abilities, which uh, well like the actors themselves not, but we have um, built-in test support that you can run the full actor, or and or um, just parts of it, and that's like would be then used from the libraries. Additionally, you can bundle tools and files. So if you have static files which you want to uh, read some data from, or if you want to bundle some tools, like because. Um, Python is maybe not fast enough, so we want to have a statically compi compiled whatever C application or something like that, you could use that as well. So what I said, workflow is basically a big box of, uh, of phases, and each of these phases con basically contains the actors. Um, since the order of the actors is actually defined by the uh, messages it consumes or produces, um, Actors that produce messages are usually coming first, and um, actors that uh, consume messages come later. And uh, it depends on what they consume and what they produce. Um, it's it's a little bit tricky to say, but it's basically a topo topology sort. So um, I guess this for people who know computer science, they should know what it means. <laughs> <coughs> 
Um, yeah, and um, with the phases, I said like there are stages. I put, didn't put them here because it would make it too small. Um, basically, you have the ability to say like, okay, um, my my actor would be executed too late in the order. I want it to be uh, executed before the other actors in the phase. So you have the ability to say like, I put this in the phase before in the before stage of the phase. Uh, by default, they go to the main phase. And if you explicitly say that it should be before, then it goes to before. If you say explicitly it go, should go after, it will be executed after that. Um, that way you can ensure that it is executed at around the same time in this phase, but you can influence the, the order. That is, for example, very important if you want to uh, influence another actor uh, with the custom actor you add. Like, uh, for example, administrator is not happy about what an actor does. For example, it, uh, Removes a file or whatever which it shouldn't, so it could the the act he could write two actors ones that backs up the file before and moves it somewhere else and afterwards like moves it back so the actor has no chance to to modify it. Of course, this is like a random example I just made up, but uh, I, I think there will be use cases where this is really uh, useful. So models are basically definable uh, data structures like this. Uh, we have a bunch of fields uh, very similar to what is um, done by um, yeah. <laughs> um, SQL Alchemy, uh, if you know Python. Uh, SQL Alchemy uh, allows you to define data models uh, for the database. Um, we have uh, support for numbers. That means we can say integers or floors, like it means it allows both. Uh, we have support for booleans, datetime objects, strings, enums, lists, and uh, we allow to embed other um, other models. However, uh, we don't support maps or dictionaries because we don't want the freeform uh, support because that forfeits the whole idea of uh, defining the model. Uh, if you do that, then please just dump it to a JSON string and like be done with it. Uh, on top of that, the data is validated, so if um, usually there should be not a problem, but like it could be due, due to the dynamicity of Python that someone puts the wrong type in there, so it would actually raise an exception if you would try to put there the wrong data type. <coughs> the repositories, um, is, as I said, it's like a big bag or cloud of, of uh, different types. I put there now three, but basically there, there are a lot of them. And um, these repositories, they can actually be linked to each other, that they have a relationship. Um, in currently, in the in the demo which I, I showed you, like there were th actually three repositories. There was a common repository which uh, hardly contains any mo anything at the moment, because it's supposed to be used for other workflow cases. Then there's the upgrade um, case, uh, uh, upgrade um, repository which contains. Um, Basically, everything that is uh, general, uh, apply applicable to, to multiple operating systems. And then the third one is like, the, we call it the offline upgrade right now, but this is basically, uh, well, RHEL or Fedora-based uh, uh, systems. Um, these, these dependencies are actually quite important because if you would like to write your own uh, repository for testing like a new actor, you can actually link one of them and can use all the information which is provided by them. Otherwise, if you create a new one, a new repository, you have no uh, models available, nothing. So you would have to start f with everything from scratch. The linking gives you the ability to avoid to have to copy anything or, or to rewrite anything. So this, this is the whole idea of this. Um, so what I said before with the tags, um, they actually are extracted from these from these repositories. Um, it scans all the actors in there and sees what tags are there, and by that it knows to which uh, of the phases in the workflow it belongs to. So this is as you see here, for example, the green one. It doesn't belong anywhere because there's no no green tag like like that. So this is a simplification of the uh, way how the actors are selected. <coughs> Additionally, we have like this bundling support. What I said, there's you can have bash scripts, binaries, whatever. Uh, the the path to it is automatically injected to your uh, of the actors um, to the actors uh, path environment variable. That means like you don't have to 
actually figure out where are you and what are you need what do you need to do you just specify the name and boom you you can just use it files you can ask there's special api calls that tell you uh, either where are the folders that have files or the second thing is it actually can search for them if you know the exact name then you can search for it by it libraries um that's like as i said shared and and bundled libraries are uh uh, shared and uh, private libraries are available, so like I already covered that before. So the next thing, this is our mascot Snacter. We call him because like it's a Python actor uh, tool. <laughs> so snake actor, right? Snacter. Um, the the tool is uh, used for um, creating templates of actors, models. Workflows. It creates full boilerplates of tags and topics. Uh, it can discover uh, in the, the repository what do you have there and display them nicely. It can export it as JSON. And it's used to link the repositories and, and resolve them. Uh, it's used to run actors uh, for testing purposes. It's used to run workflows for testing purposes. Um, of course, if you try to run an in-place upgrade a workflow, that will not go well. Because um, that is, it needs root, it needs uh, root rights, it needs a lot of things, and that might actually blow up into your face. So <laughs> don't try it. Um, yeah, cool. Empty slide, no. <laughs> so Python is the first class citizen. That means like we do everything mainly in Python. However, all the things, yes, right now, but. It doesn't have to be. Um, if you need to do something in a different language, well, bundle these these things in a different language and just use them. And like, for example, for like, if someone really wants to use Bash, we might actually start. Uh, if there are like enough people who who really have a need for it, we might actually start providing you um, some some libraries that uh, or like which you can use, like um, which you can include in your scripts, and and then basically. Um, send messages as well and, and things like this write it directly from there or request the files uh, the same way like it was um, if you use the bash scripts I mean basically you will still have to write that um, Python actor uh, but we might actually start cr creating some kind of um, boilerplate that will allow you to say uh, I, I want it I wanted to call a certain bash script in my t in my uh, in my tools folder, and uh, that will automatically start it, and we would just like um, process it. So, uh, last thing, I wanted to show you how it actually looks like to write actors, um, because uh, it might be a little bit um, how do you say that uh, intimidating. So, for that reason, I wanted to show it how it looks like. So, <laughs> so um, this is a pre-made uh, repository. It has some tags, topics, and uh, workflows. Um, as I said before, you can use the Snacktoc tool to discover things. So, if you want to know what's there, uh, okay, this is really a bit too small, uh, too big. So. Um, you see, like it, it will show you what tags you have. It shows you what demo topics you have, uh, what topics you have, what uh, workflows you have defined. And in this case, the workflow is very simple. Um, it's a also in Python defined. It is has only one face, and it's just for the demo purpose because it's like otherwise it would blow your mind. 
<laughs> like if you would see the, the in place upgrade, it is just too long. Um, so for this task, uh, for this uh, live coding, I, I was uh, saying like I, I will write an actor that produces a message and that consumes it and prints it. So, and then execute at the end the workflow. And in the meantime, I can also show you how it looks like when they run. So, Snector, uh, you write uh, first of all the new model and you uh, want to use the, the tags. You don't have to specify the tags, um, sorry, tags, topic. You don't have to specify the topic immediately, it's just um, gives you the ability to uh, avoid having to write it yourself later in the, in the produced thing. So right now the, the boilerplate created looks like this. Like and uh, since we want to send a message, we should be a string, right? So, and we make it required, and that you write your model, you're done. Um, next thing we want to do is like we will want to write the actor. So, you an actor, new actor, tag is will define like that we want to have it in the flock face tag, which is flock face, and we want to have it in the flock workflow. So. We say workflow tag, and this is like a flock message producer. So we got the new uh, the boilerplate here. There's everything. Um, okay, in this case, it we want also want to uh, produce uh, the the flock message. So from models import flock message, um, and we produce this. So flock message. So one one thing to say, if you would want to use a library for this, you would actually just use from leap actors, uh, from leap libraries, sorry, libraries, actor import, and that is your private ones. And if it is like a shared one, it would be here, like if we import common. So that basically this is how it looks like. Yeah, if you, there's nothing magic to it. Uh, from the usage. It's just that for every actor which is actually executed in an own process, uh, it's a forked child of the main process, um, it gets actually injected all the private uh, libraries that are available and uh, it, so that it always has the same path no matter how the actor is called or anything. So producing the message is actually quite simple. It's like produce um, and uh, you just like say what uh, instantiate the the uh, model and say a message like hello flock 2018 right so, so now uh, we can use nectar run uh, flock message producer uh, print output and it will show you that it actually created a message here um, if you don't say print output, it will actually not do anything. It will just like um, show you the um, normal output. So there's nothing um, what you could see from it. You could have added a log message, which I could show you as well. This is a relatively simple self log info uh, sent message. And then if you if you run it, then you actually can see it uh, in here. You see, and you see that this was your actor who is a flock message producer and uh, in you can actually s um, use the logs to um, filter it for you actor for example um, that's that so let's go on to the um, to the produce ah one more thing if you well, I will show you the later so the new uh, the the consuming actor which will print it um, let's do the same thing flock um, Face tag, tag, flock, uh, work, workflow tag, and um, consumes flock message. Uh, oh, it's like uh, flock message consumer. Um, actors. Mm -hmm. no? Ah, yeah, of course. Uh, so. This time I, I did not forget to add this this consumes and automatically uh, adds it here. It also automatically imports it. And uh, for the ones who are very uh, keen about the order of imports, it's even in the alphabetical order. Um, 
Yes. Uh, messages are are not uh, like uh, it's not a like a queue or anything. It messages, it and you have n there's no way of influencing it. So uh, they cannot be removed or anything. They are there and that's it. Once they're there, they can be consumed by anyone who who knows their name basically. And um, I mean basically the consuming part or the producing part, you you're not restricted to one uh, thing uh, or self-consume thing. Um, they pass. Actually, consume works a little bit different. Like the produce, like you pass the type, and with this, it, it will just do the lookup. But you're actually able to say like, frog other message or whatever. You have a different different one. You can get consume both of them. But since you uh, this, it returns a, a generator, so uh, you would have to check what type it is. So usually you don't want that. But if you if you're fine with it, for example, they have both the same structure, just different names, and you don't care. Why not? You know, so I mean, that's the the beauty of Python in this case, that it allows you to do these things. So for message in um, in self consume mess, uh, self consume flock message, and now you can actually just well, let's use the logger uh, message message, and it's like. Uh, Do it like this. I oh, well, we can do it properly with um, logging styles, so it doesn't do it if the style is not enabled. Anyway, so that's all you need to do to do it uh, to to uh, produce it. Now, if you would want to c uh, run the actor, you could do again snacker run. Uh, well, actually, it doesn't matter if it is uppercase or lowercase. I could say uh, I can write it like this as well. Uh, if you see that, it actually doesn't do anything because it didn't get the message. So before um, the other actor we had, we can actually, um, yeah, what was it? Save. Okay. So it's save output. If you do that, it will be locally stored in your in your um, repository in, in in the in the database there. There's a uh, there's a it's a database actually, um, which you can review if you want. That is just containing all the data, um, and you can now consume it in your uh, in your other actor. So now you will see that there actually it printed here the the message which was forwarded. So and um, now since we had the workflow, you can use Snacker workflow run flock and ta da. Thus the same thing. <coughs> so much for the demo. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? So, so, please. Well, right now, well, how it would be. The, qu the question is if, if uh, we would use this in Fedora, if we would have a repository that we can use someone else already wrote. Um, the idea is that the, um, that the actors are actually so, uh, present all the time. And that if something is not available, like for example, not installed and it would not affect it, there should be actually uh, a multiple sets of actors normally. For example, there should be in the beginning, there should be something that scans for this stuff and figures out there's nothing and it would not produce a message. Later, the another actor gets executed, which would consume a message, but the message is not present, so it wouldn't do anything. And that way, it is uh, the idea of, of how this should work is like this. So well, your question. Like, I mean, basically, and the availability, to get to the availability, um, well, there would be basically installed um, well the default set of like what we support in Fedora uh, would be inst should be installed basically the moment you install the leap tool um, who wants to add uh, want to use third party ones well you can just include them into etc leap uh, repos D as a symlink the repository 
and they will get, uh, uh, for the upgrade, they get injected into that. They get automatically loaded. Anything what is in the repos D folder gets actually injected. That works without the linking, actually. But most of the times they use the linking as well because like, they would refer to other things from there to consume, to be actually using the tags to be injected into that whole uh, workflow. Yeah, without that it wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's, okay, the question is like basically um, sharing actors between different databases, for example. The example was that one uh, developer is maintaining MariaDB, the other one is Postgres. For MariaDB they are implemented and the Postgres developer would like to uh, reuse a bunch of them. Um, in that case, I would actually wonder if that would not be a use case for shared libraries. Um, that's the first thing that might actually solve your problem already. Uh, if you share them on repository level, that um, then they are like r usable by anyone. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is like, if necessary, yes, you can use them. This is just like you basically produce the same messages and it would do something. But you need to be careful. Um, generic actors might be a sign of that it is actually supposed to be a, sh a library. Because uh, it's if it is generic code, that is more a library than actually an actor. An actor should be specialized to specific tasks. Okay. Any other questions? Well, to be quite honest, I, I'm a sti still a little bit um, back and forth with the idea where to. Oh, sorry, uh, where should live basically the actors? Like, should they live with the uh, with the product, or uh, um, which which is affected by it, or should they live basically in a global repository for all all the things? Like, uh, let's say there's a upstream project which main manage manage maintains them um, for for Fedora. Um, to be quite honest, I don't really know right now what is the best approach here because um, in initially I would have uh, one like one global one only, a uh, one place where to put them, um, and that is because until you have everyone uh, on the same page of like how should be actors written and how should be basically you would need to set up something like uh, the packaging guidelines. You would have to set up something similar. And uh, this needs to be undergoing reviews. So at this, m because um, otherwise it's endangering the upgrade process. You might actually do something which is dangerous and you should need someone who looks over it a bit that until you basically understand how to do it. And uh, anything that is in Fedora, I think it would be beneficial to have one global place. To like what is by default Fedora should be one global place. Is it like something external like Copper or whatever? They should bundle their repositories like with their uh, RPM and have it specialized. And it's like something like what, what like for example in a in a RHEL scenario where we products it's called. They are like based on RHEL and we have like for example Rev and they would be upgraded to uh, want to upgrade together with. Um, with the major version of RHEL to the new version of RHEL, they w should provide, for example, their own uh, um, repositories. Very specific, has absolutely nothing to do with the base operating system, and then it should be bundled. And that's like falling under the section of three uh, third-party um, application developers. So does it answer the question? Good. Any other question? Mm -hmm. But it's fine. <laughs> do, do do you want uh do you want uh want to see that um oh wait a moment what what did you see once more? Okay, so 
Oh, okay, okay. Uh, it is actually, um, yeah, the question is like, uh, what's the magic behind the, the library support? <laughs> um, well, in, in the libraries, um, we have basically, um, we scan the repository, um, we figure out what files are there, and the moment you start an actor, we see like, oh, there are libraries. Okay, it's like there's, there's, there are files in there. So in that moment, we, since the actors are started in their own process, um, about we use multiprocessing for it and fork basically at that moment before we load anything. And uh, what we do is we, we dynamically import this and uh, insert them into the module dynamically on runtime so that you can do that. And, and it has support for packages and, and modules. So if you use a normal Python package, that works perfectly fine. Um, the only thing is like if you would want to use third party stuff, like let's say SQL Alchemy or whatever, things like this, um, there's like one one restriction on, on actors. You cannot globally import them. And it is simply because we do uh, we, we load the actors quickly. And if you're having a missing dependency, it will blow up and uh, it will make everything fail. But we can ignore this eventually. But like right now, it would everything fail with it um, because we, we, don't, we want them to, to load successfully. It is considered like a broken actor, which is a problem because we don't know why it is broken. So um, the uh, functionality there is also because of testing. If someone forgets, like we, we want to have some make files that uh, specify the, the uh, dependencies, what you need. Or, or some other way, we, we are not really 100% sure how to go with the dependencies uh, of this. Uh, most likely we will have to use something else than a make file because we need to in, in eventually eject it into the spec files. Um, so you would need to provide that for the test as well. So the test tries to load the actor and will fail. So uh, it is, it's, um, it's complicated. So I, I mean, like you should look at it, then you will see why. Uh, if you're really deeply interested in it, but in, in general, it, I mean, the 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 way how this uh, the libraries are injected is relatively simple from the idea. It's just dynamic import with reassignment of the module to uh, to the to the place, and afterwards, it's also environment variables get injected, and it is basically running in a context manager and cleans up everything afterwards. So, yeah. anything else? No, that was about that was about uh, modernization. What does it mean? So update update can be. It's not in context of the Fedora upgrades in this case. It is more uh, what does modernization mean? It's like you bring the software up to date, or you bring the data to the up to date version. I just used update slash upgrade because to me, quite honestly, this is ambiguous. You know, this it's n there's no clear line. What is an upgrade or what is an update? At least to me, not of us. So, no, 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 no. Yeah. Well, actually, actually, sorry for interrupting you. Actually, um, thinking about it, I mean, like there would be no problem using leap to create a workflow for updates as well. Yeah, because the, my my uh, uh, my use case was basically that the modules can uh, theoretically create something for example this Postgres uh, example. I I turn on uh, some module which is like different than what I have on my system, and then when I run uh, the update, in this case maybe I want to see the same message uh, as as I would see uh, during the upgrade, for example. It will well, actually, thinking about it, what you're just saying, like I mean, basically the the point is that. Um, oh, <laughs> summarizing that, what you just said. <laughs> um, basically, the, the the question is if uh, you could um, in the basically have same messages about like what we had here for the upgrades, also in the update scenarios. Um, so, for if someone would turn on a module and uh, and make it, it is available, we could detect that, of course, and it could suggest that he he does that. Um, on the contrary. Uh, the questions, it happens sometimes on Fedora that some major version upgrades during the life cycle happen, but it's very discouraged from what I know. So I don't think that is really a use case. Um, in, I mean, that particular example. I, I can imagine that there might be some things that you want, want to do. Maybe this might be interesting to system administrators. 
um, to add notifications, for example. It's like something happened, something was updated, something wasn't updated, things like that. So, yeah, kind of lost track of time. Uh, okay, <laughs> I, I I don't know I I don't know how long it is actually going. Thank you.